next episode of Community Pulse. I'm Mary Thingval at Mary underscore Grace on Twitter. And I am PJ at Esplenic on Twitter. And today we have two guests. We're going to talk about uh, kind of the public versus private life of people working in the community. And our two guests are Coraline Ada Emke and Mr. Funkatron himself, Ed Finkler. Uh, introduce yourselves. I'm Coraline Ada Emke. Um, I work at GitHub on the community and safety team building community management and anti-harassment and, um, tools into the GitHub platform. Um, probably best known for creating the Contributor Covenant, which is the most popular open source um, project code of conduct in the world with over 14,000 adoptions, including Rails, JRuby, F Sharp, and Swift. Oh, hi. Uh, my name is Ed Finkler. Um, I am the CTO at a company called Graph Story. And I've been a web developer for about 20 years. And I also started a nonprofit called Open Sourcing Mental Illness. And I've been talking a lot about mental health issues for the past three or four years uh, at tech conferences and things like that. All right. So I kind of want to open the floor pretty early. You both obviously have private lives, but you are also both very public people. Um, and I sure. guess the, the, the first question, like, how do you... Where, where do you draw the line? I mean, obviously, when you're working in the community, you're meeting a lot of people. There's a lot of people to talk to. There's a lot of people to see. You're going to conferences. You're going to meetups, what have you. Mm -hmm. uh, where do you draw the line between what you're going to, you know, reveal publicly versus what, you know, what you just want to keep to yourself on kind of more or less a permanent basis? Who goes first? Do I go first okay. because I said something? Oh, crap. I go, go for first. it. <laughs> <laughs> Corey introduced yourself first, so now you got to go first. I think. Yeah, right. I think that's a really good question, and it's changed for me over the years. I used to, I used to be significantly more private, and I used to like not like to post pictures of my kid on social media stuff, even Facebook, like at all. And uh, now, you know, I, I do some, and that's okay. At the same time, I also I probably am careful about the kinds of things I say. Also, there's really, it's, it's Facebook and Twitter and, and I kind of have different audiences there. Like I have a really, a, a much bigger audience on Twitter. Um, and then on Facebook, it's like a smaller group of people. Um, and so, and it's more kind of family stuff and things like that. But so it's funny is that I'll probably make more, ribald jokes on uh on twitter um but if i'm going to get like serious about something i'd be more likely to talk about it on uh on on facebook in some way in some ways especially if it was something that affected I, i've talked about some pretty personal stuff on twitter particularly about my own mental health stuff uh, what I haven't done is probably stuff that affects my family, you know, things like that. And sometimes I'm, I, I am kind of private about a lot of that stuff, even though like I tend to be kind of an oversharer. I tend to, I mean, that's sort of like my personality is to probably talk about a lot of stuff that people don't, but then there's things that I'm, I, I'm not, you know, I don't share about a lot like, um, Gosh, this would be this. This is probably the first time I've mentioned it outside of writing it on Facebook. But I came out as queer on Facebook, like, and it was kind of after that Orlando stuff went down, and I was kind of like, I I just didn't feel I just it was something I kind of thought about for a little bit, and then I was like, I feel like I want to say something about it, and it's not a huge deal for me. And generally, I sort of feel like, um, my uh. A sex life is kind of nobody's fucking business. So mine, you know, right. I don't, I don't care. And I don't really need to hear about it. If you want to talk about it, it's fine. But it, I just, I, I, I want to be able to make those choices about it uh, for myself. But um, yeah, so there, I mean, so I, I am kind of private, even though I'm private or share. Um, and I think, but I also know that I generally feel safer than some people. I don't experience a ton of harassment, for example. I don't have people who just out of the blue come up and like give me shit about stuff, you know, for things that I say. Um, I don't know. So I'm, I think I'm kind of lucky in that respect. But 
I, I definitely, you know, I hold back on some stuff. I, and I'm not sure that I, I kind of think about it every time, you know. So, yeah, there's definitely stuff, like stuff about that's intimate stuff. I tend to not, like, I don't really want to talk about that. But I know people who are super open about their, about all that stuff and more power to them, you know. So I have some pretty clear lines. Um, I, um one of my goals is to make things easier for other transgender people who came after me and demonstrate that you can be successful while being trans in tech. So anything related to my transition, I've been very, very public about on Twitter, on Facebook, um, in interviews, um, whenever, whenever I'm in the public eye, um, because I think we have a lot of taboos in our society and some of them definitely deserve to be smashed. I'm also pretty open about um, having bipolar disorder and anxiety and PTSD because I think that there's a stigma around mental health that we need to smash as well. Um, I am a public figure, as PJ said, and um, I unfortunately do have a lot of harassment. Um, I've been doxxed twice. Um, Reddit and 4chan love me, apparently. They can't stop talking about me. Um, and um, Twitter, of course, and so on. Um, I even have a stalker, so a lot of fun. Um, so I'm very careful, basically, to protect um, where I live. Um, if someone comes to visit me, I make sure that they turn off location services on their phone. Um, I don't mention my family members by name. Um, I don't talk about my relationships. Um, and um, I save all the personal stuff either for Facebook, which is friends and family, or um, I have a private Twitter account because um, I don't really feel safe talking about things that make me feel vulnerable, um, insecurities or um, problems I'm facing and things like that on, in public, on public Twitter. So I have a private friends only Twitter account for sharing things like that. Um, I'm also in a lot of Slack communities and depending on the community, I'll either be really, really open about things or a little more guarded depending on how safe I feel. I think that's a, a big part of it, right, is how safe do we feel on each of these platforms and how safe do we feel sharing with the people that we're sharing with on that platform. Um, I have a couple friends that are very cautious about what lists of people on Facebook they share certain things with. So if it's a, you know, relatively public thing and, hey, just talking about my day and no big deal, it's, it's a public share, right? And for other things, it's, you know, well, it's only this specific list of these specific people kind of a deal. I think it's an interesting, interesting society, and not in a good way, um, where we feel like we have to have to separate those things. And as as people who are heavily involved in the community, I think it affects us personally and professionally. Well, I, th I think the thing is too that we have to kind of we have to dance on this kind of edge, in a way where you have to make people feel that they know something about you in order to kind of gain that community credibility like they you have to know you're a developer they have to know you're an authority on this subject matter they have to know that you have this history that that could be true or false I, i've mentioned this before in a couple of blog posts like i know that there's some people out there that, that do what i do as a technical advocate and they're completely full of shit but they can they can talk the talk um and they'll admit that they're full of shit and that's fine um but they're doing the job that they need to be doing um so i mean I think the division between private and public is is one thing, but how do you make people how do you make people comfortable and make them feel like they know you without giving away you know letting the cat out of the bag so to speak? I think I do a lot of that one on one. If um if someone meets me at a conference, I'm able to judge like um, how much I trust people, and I really trust my instincts about people. Um, so I'm definitely willing to share more in person and one-on-one -on -one situations. Um, but like I said, it, it basically for me comes down to a safety consideration. And there are some things that are nobody's business. Like I don't even want to mention what they might be. But, um, and those I don't talk about publicly or, and I'd be very selective about who I talk to privately about some things too. But hopefully um, through, um, by communicating some personal things as well as like things I'm passionate about and, um, sort of my mission in open source. Um, hopefully I, I have a good mix of personal and professional and passion. Um, although I've been told a few times by people who know me online and then meet me in person that they expected me to be a lot more militant 
And um, I'm like a really, really easygoing kind of person and really friendly. And um, I, think I, uh, I don't bring up politics and things like that in casual conversations. So it's a little weird for me. Interesting. I think part of it for me, uh, as someone who attends a lot of conferences and talks to a lot of people and meets a lot of people, like you said, Coraline, you have to be able to judge people for, you know, okay, is, is, this, is, this, is it a safe environment? Is it a place where I can talk through things? Is it, is, it, is it a place where I can bring up stuff that I might not tell everybody or that I have to gauge what someone's reaction is going to be first? Um, I know I went through a period last year of and really, really hard burnout and knowing, okay, I can, I can talk about this in these circles, but knowing who I can talk to about it and what level I can talk to things about, because it's, it's a very different thing to say, oh, I'm, I'm feeling burned out and to say, no, like I, I can't function when I look at my email inbox or I can't function when I'm trying to keep up with Twitter and Slack and everything else, right? Like those are two very different ways of presenting that problem. Um, I know another aspect of it for me is, is being concerned about how things will come across on Twitter as, as a public face of a company and making sure that, that, that what I'm saying on Twitter and what I'm saying in public comes across in a quote unquote proper way to be accurately reflecting the, the goals and the mission of the company. And that's, that's something that's hard for me to balance because I want to be myself. I want to be able to have my own personality and have my own things that I think are funny and everything else, but making sure that none of that is going to reflect poorly on the company is a real concern. How do you manage those expectations? I think that's a, 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 that's a really good question. And I think I'm still, I would count myself pretty lucky in, the res, in, in this respect that I've generally been able to be in positions where I can express myself as I want to and not have too much concern from the organization that I'm with uh, that it would that they would be concerned about that I would cause problems or things like that. A lot of that usually leads to my sense of humor, which um, can sometimes be a bit dark. Uh, and, and I think that that uh, has a time, you know, I could see in some organizations that could be a problem. Um, in the one that I'm in, uh, or the ones that I've been in, I think I've been probably kind of lucky in the sense that it, they're not all that concerned about that. Um, I have had a couple, I can remember one incident where somebody, when I, I was working uh, uh, for, actually for a university, a department at a university, and somebody contacted the person who ran the department and trying to get me in trouble, I guess, for something that I had said or some, you know, some website that I worked on or something like that. And pretty much the guy who's the director of it said, uh, I don't give a crap. Obviously, you're just trying to be an asshole. And secondly, why would I care what he does in his personal time? Mm -hmm. um, so he had what I think was the correct reaction, uh, right. thankfully. But there are plenty of folks who would not, and I was just lucky, I think there's plenty of folks who would not have had that same reaction, who would have been very concerned about the potential public, you know, oh my God, we're going to find out about this, this would affect our funding, you know, so I can see that happening. I think I've just been kind of lucky. Um, and a lot of people are in those positions. I am. Um, I feel like where I am in GitHub um, and the team I am on in particular, um, which is a team of people who really care about social ju justice issues. Um, I don't really, I don't worry about um, things that I say publicly reflecting poorly on my team or on GitHub, but I don't, on my Twitter profile, I don't list that I work at GitHub because I don't want my words associated with them in any way. Um, I feel like I'm under a lot of scrutiny being um, in the position that I am and taking the stands that I've taken. Um, and uh, I just learned this week so apparently people regularly report me to um, the GitHub Terms of Service team and um, for what they perceive as like violations of ethics or 
say, oh, Coraline's harassing this person or Coraline said, dude, bro, Coraline's racist against white people and so on. So um, I just learned this week that in our support ticket system, there is a uh, label that gets applied to certain um, reports um, and it's GitHub Hearts Coraline. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's it's, it's interesting because it's kind of it, it it is kind of you do draw you do draw scrutiny you do draw um, attention when you're trying to bring attention to issues and it's kind of like no I'm trying to draw attention to the issue not to me it's about this it's not about me um, but it seems that human beings have real problems distinguishing between those two things. It's kind of ironic that um, a lot of people um, who are critical of Contributor Covenant don't have a problem with the document itself, but they say, well, Coraline's politics are problematic. Um, and yet these are the same people who um, su subscribe to the, to the notion of meritocracy where um, who you are doesn't matter and only the intellectual value that you produce matters. So there's kind of a contradiction there, right? Well, yeah, it's like, it's like a mental, uh, what did it, a friend of mine used to call it, situational ethics. Yeah, um, a situational application of meritocracy or intellectual discussion. It's like, yeah, well, it wasn't a situation I like, sure. But when it's someone I don't care for, well, then it's not, no, that's not what it is. It's not good. We need to, we need to stamp this down. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, it's, it's kind of insanity. Kind of. <laughs> yeah. So given, given the luck that you've had, Ed, and the position that you're in, Coraline, do you tend to look at the companies, say you're applying for a new job, do you tend to look at the company and say, okay, is this a company that I'm going to feel comfortable talking on Twitter and talking uh, on Facebook or, or things that I'm putting out there? You know, do you have a perspective of they will be okay with me as I am and, and being able to post that stuff and being conscious of being known for working at GitHub or wherever you happen to be, or is that something that kind of comes afterwards? I, 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 I can, of course, only speak for myself. I think that it is probably the case that I do think about it some, but I kind of view it as, do these seem like folks who are fairly uptight about social media presence kinds of things? Like, uh, and I know it, I've got friends or family who worked at uh, things that like, like worked for large corporations and they did have like social media policies and things like that, right? Um, so that, so it, it made the, it made the people essentially never, you know, list publicly where they worked, uh, because they didn't want to, because they would get in trouble if they did say, Hey, I work here. And then it was like, here is a picture of me drinking a beer or something like that. Right. Right. Um, and so, you know, I've, I've always wanted to, and I'll say, tell you the first thing is that I feel really lucky that I actually get this choice. I think there's lots of people who don't. Um, there's, a, you know, being able to work in tech is is, uh, is unlike a lot of uh, career paths in, uh, in at least in the United States, where you know a lot of careers don't exactly pay all that great, or it's not the thing where I can be like, oh, I don't like my job, I can go find something else. Um, but I do think about, and I do listen to what people have to say, and do they seem like they're kind of uptight or they're kind of easygoing? You know, I do tell them in the last like rounds that I did in terms of looking for a new gig, I was telling everybody, "Hey, I talk a lot about mental health stuff, for example, and I talk about that very publicly, and I need to be able to keep doing this kind of work." Um, so that's. I, I mean, I would be shocked if they missed that, if they did any research on me, but that was something that was really important to me. And, and I, I kind of figure there's, it's probably the case that people who are interested in me have done a little bit of, uh, you know, they've probably filtered out self-selected a little bit anyway, um, because I'm pretty loud. About it. It's really, you know, my, my Twitter account's been around for a long time. And, uh, 
uh, there's plenty of stuff there. Uh, so it's not anything that I think anybody's going to be surprised by. I'm pretty much like how those things come off. Um, but yeah, uh, I also feel really privileged that I don't, I'm in a position where I can kind of pick and choose where I get to work. And uh, a lot of people don't have those choices. Mm-hmm. That is a privilege, and I, I think some of it comes from our seniority, probably. We have a little bit more mobility. Um, I um, What I do, if I'm talking to a company, a potential employer, I have um, very clear values um, as a developer um, for my professional life. I have them actually spelled out. Um, and during the interview process, I try to suss out what values the company has and see what kind of overlap there is and what kind of alignment there is because if my values are not aligned with theirs, probably I'm going to be unhappy with them and they're going to be pretty unhappy with me. Right. And that's huge. Making sure that your values are aligned makes you happier in your day-to-day job. It makes you more comfortable at your workplace. It means you're more likely to get along and have good relationships with your colleagues, right? Like that, that plays into a lot of different things. Most importantly, I can bring my whole self. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Have you ever been in a situation to kind of jump off that where it seemed like through the interview process, everything seemed great. Everything was just meshing and, and their values were your values. Everything is great. And then like two weeks, a month, a month and a half. And you're like, wait, wait a minute. What, what happened to all that shit we talked about, you know, 45 days ago? What, what was all that about? Cause that is not what's happening right now. That happened to me in a pretty big way. Um, before my transition, Um, When I recognized that I was going to transition, but before I had done anything about it, really, um, I went looking for a company that was safe, safe, a safe place for me to come out and a safe place for me to transition. Um, And I had been in startups for five or six years before that, and they did not feel like the right environment for me. So I decided to go to a larger company that had an HR department, that had policies in place, that had anti-discrimination policies in place and transition there, even if that meant the work was a little less exciting. Um, So I went to an apartment finder company that was really large and really well known. And I was very active um, in terms of like the LGBT group and um, pushing for comprehensive healthcare for everyone and um, those sorts of things. So I think they assumed that I was a gay man. And um, in January of my last year there, um, I got promoted to principal developer. In February, I came out as trans, and in March, I was fired. Oh, that's oh that's wow, wild. huh? I, and and sort of, I, I say that's what, and I've already heard that story, but it's still every time you tell that story, it's like, holy shit, really? Yeah, um, it happens. It's, and it's um, hard transgender to, people are not a protected class in most states. Right. Mm-hmm. So that being said, how do you how do you tend to react when something like that happens, or when someone takes something that you've posted or said out of context, right? Because I think those two things can be related. Once it, one is internal to the company, one is mm-hmm. could be external or internal to the company. Either people in, inside the company reacting to what you've said or done, or outside of the company. I talk about it without hesitation um, because we have to bring these things to light. Um, they're very personal and private issues. Um, but if we don't talk about it, then other people are going to get hurt by those same companies. Is it, is it kind of like the idea of if I don't carry my own shield, no one's going to get behind me anyway? Yeah. Mm. I like that. I like that a lot. That's interesting. I, uh, I haven't had, I, I've been lucky that I haven't had, I keep talking about how lucky I am, gosh. If, if nothing comes out of this, this podcast, it's your appreciation for your own life, Ed. Yeah, <laughs> no, I, I well, well, believe me, I think about that a lot. Um, I think that, you know, I, we see really tough stories that play out in the media uh, one way or another about about things where, I always feel like, you know, if everybody had just, like, if you just were like, hey, that wasn't cool, and then, like, two other people were like, oh, yeah, you're right, that wasn't cool, I won't do that again, sorry about that, and then that would sort of be it, but it, it, when things play out and suddenly it, it turns into a giant social tribal mess, um, uh, gosh, I'm glad that I haven't had to deal with that, 
Um, I mean, I've occasionally had things, like I said, something about that we had t-shirts that were, and I called them women's cut t-shirts that we were, and we were giving those ones away for free. And I was doing that because the, the sizing was kind of weird on them and they were basically too small for a lot of people. Like the small was like a toddler. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I was like, I can't, you know, nothing just, just, I'd rather see people just have the shirts and, and if it, hopefully it'll fit them. And if not, it's, they can, I don't know, make a, make a pillow out of them, which somebody actually did. And so I, you know, I did that and I got nice responses from normal people. And then there was somebody who was like, women's cut. And I think he thought I meant like crop tops like naval exposing shirts, which, you know, if that's what you want to wear, go to town, you know, that's cool. But that was not what I was giving. Not really my thing, but. Yeah, I mean, that's cool. I mean, I could, I could do that and look like Johnny Depp in uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, but the, the, that was not what, you know, that was not what I meant. He was like, this is why it's terrible for women in tech. And I was like, whoa, hold on there, brother man. Um, Hey, I that I, I just wrote I, I I in fact quoted him so I made sure people saw what I was saying and said that was not my intent. This is what I meant. There you go. And thankfully that it, it kind of started a couple of people got real pushy with the guy, and I actually not sure it helped because they kind of just kind of really laid into him on it. Mm. I'm not really sure that helped. I think it would be better just I just explained myself. There you go, that's it. I sort of had some folks who, I think their intent was very good, but they kind of, I think were kind of hostile. It ended up that the, the dude, you could tell he kind of shut down because he was getting a lot of criticism. It was a lot of pretty harsh criticism. And honestly, I think he was just confused and misunderstood and overreacted. I've had that kind of thing happen a few times. It's annoying and it's, that, just that stresses me out. I would hate to imagine something I said that blew up into sort of some sort of viral controversy, right. which I, I don't, I don't know that I could handle that because I, I know sort of my capacity to handle things and how I tend to internalize conflict. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how well I would do there. I think that would be very hard. And, uh, and I, there but for the grace of God or other people who have to deal with that stuff than me, you know what I mean? And I admire their the, the strength and, and of folks who still try to sort of steer, you know, uh, steer the waters where it's they're, they're just catching shit all the time, like Coraline, Jesus, I don't I don't know. You're a you're a stronger person than I because I'm not because I don't I don't think I could do that. I just don't. Um and uh, so, yeah, I mean, the stuff I've dealt with is minor. I always wish that people would just be like, everybody just calm down and don't assume the worst about everyone. Right. And but it's, that's, not, that's not people's first reactions. It's not how, not how people work, unfortunately. No, not really. It doesn't seem that way. As much as I keep hoping it can change that, it doesn't really work like that. Definitely. Well, unfortunately, we've got to start wrapping up here. So briefly, are there any tools or projects or events or things that you'd like to share uh, that have to do with community building or um, how, to, how to be yourself when you live a relatively public life um, or even just things that you're using to decompress? Well, that's a good question. Um, I've, I guess I've been sort of focused on some of the, the negative consequences of being public. Um, so I would like to share a couple of tools that um, people more in my position might find useful. Um, the first is Crash Override, which is um, they have a great tool on, for um, protecting your identity online um, that walks you through like setting up two-factor authentication on all your accounts and some other like sort of safety basics for protecting your identity. Um, very handy um, and I recommend it for anyone who's like visible um, and controversial um, and the other resource that really came in handy with me during the Ruby Code of Conduct debacle um, is a site called HeartMob um, and what that is is you open a case with HeartMob 
um, to let them know that you're being harassed and um, they investigate it and um, they start monitoring social media for you and reporting people who um, are posting harassing things um, for you so that you don't have to go through and monitor all that crap yourself because that psychologically is just like can be so overwhelming and, and can lead you to shut down or, or really doubt yourself. So having a service like that, it's all volunteer run. Um, they had a Kickstarter to get started. Um, so knowing that people have your back um, is, is a great help. So those two resources I think would come in handy um, if you do cross that line um, and you do elicit a negative reaction from the world at large. My suggestions are going to be much more pedestrian than Coraline's because I have not uh, had to deal with the kind of uh, shit show behavior uh, that uh, she's had to. Um, but a couple things that I do is that I had to teach myself that it was okay to just simply ignore people and enforce that ignoring process <laughs> Uh, for my health, for my mental health, and leading to my physical health, because I am a person who internalizes conflict, and I am a person that I cannot ignore sort of like triggers of conversation and getting involved in that, even when I know this person is just being a skadoosh, and I would like them to just shut up. Um, what I have learned was that on Twitter, I use Tweetbot. There's probably super powerful tools for this. Tweetbot, though, I like the muting features of Tweetbot way more than anything else I've ever used. And the reason why is because I can mute it so it is next to impossible for somebody to say anything to me and me to see it. And I use it not just, oh, this is a terrible person that I'm just going to but in fact, I often use it for the sake of what this person is saying, there's nothing wrong with it, but I feel stressed about it. So I need to filter out that for a little while. And maybe it's for a day, and maybe it's for a week, or maybe it's for longer. Um, another thing that I do is I follow people on Twitter because I want to keep them open still be their friends and probably have them not be mad at me. But also, if they wanted to send me a direct message, they could, because I'm not going to just open up direct messages to everybody. That seems like a horrible idea. Um, but what I do is then I don't look, though, at my main timeline. I look at a list that I call happy, and those are people who I can look at them and still try kind of be happy. <laughs> Where it's actually a measure of my, like, this is what I can handle. And it doesn't, somebody's on there, it's not doing anything wrong, that, who's not on there, it's not necessarily doing anything wrong. It is, but they might be somebody who talks about stuff a lot that just kind of stresses me out. Like maybe they're super into politics. I am not. And I have made about that. Yeah, and it's you know what I I can't remember if you're on the happy list. Or not, <laughs> I'm, My, I'm now I'm now striving to make the happy list. Yeah, That's right. Goal. It's a good goal. And, right. It's and and, and I, it doesn't have anything to do with the other people. It has to do with me mm -hmm. and what I can handle and what I can't handle. And and knowing that and filtering the input that I choose to allow in. Um, and uh, you know, so that part of it. And then, you know, on Facebook, a lot of times what it is is that I, I will I'll unfollow people if they stress me out. I might still be friends with them, but I just don't want their stuff to show up in my time. Right. <laughs> and it doesn't, again, maybe it was because they were like, even, even if it's stuff that's like, I'm like, oh, it's just somebody I wildly disagree with. But even if they're just talking about stuff that tends to, that like, I already know how I feel. Seeing this over and over just stresses me out. Like stuff that that I feel really strongly about, um, and I happen to agree with them. But it's like I don't want to have sort of in my face over and over like all sort of the, a bunch of outrage about X, Y, or Z because it just is like I can't do this. I can't do it. And I'm glad that I have the opportunity to step away and say that because it's something that I, 
I wish I could do a better job of that and just not let it and not internalize it, but I do. And so I have to make those decisions. I think that, I think you have to be kind of careful about that because I think that it's like, you don't want to disengage to the point where you're like, la, 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 these things aren't happening. You know? <laughs> but I think that um, you have to sort of know your limits and it's part of what I guess you might call self-care or you might call just knowing what you can, you're capable of. And um, it's kind of, you know, that for me, those are, those are a couple things that I do. Um, I have at times completely uninstalled social media clients. I have at times uh, edited my Etsy host file so that I blocked it. Um, and not just for work purposes, for like me, I can't engage in this because this is bad for me if I engage. Um, and you do your best and and to to try to to try to control that and and you just try to figure out what you're capable of handling but i think the main thing that was important was being conscious of how these things affect you and if it's not like you find yourself like getting unhappy and anger is a sign often of being unhappy and like detrimentally unhappy about stuff I think you have to look at, you know, what are the patterns here? And maybe I should choose different patterns. And so sometimes I have to adjust that. Um, I'm, I'm lucky in the sense that I get to, uh, I, I work in a, you know, I, I work in a sort of a, a with the, the mental health stuff that it's very much like, that's not particularly controversial. I have, I've, and I, I've had very few people ever say to me, like, what you're doing is bullshit. Like, how could you, how could yeah, you? how could you do that? I, I just, I've had like a couple people, but that's out of that. So you're talking 99% of stuff is like super positive and, and that, it, that makes it easier. It makes it a lot easier for me. Uh, you know, um, but uh, yeah, so, so I don't know. That's a thing. It's just, it's just trying to figure that out. And I think, boy, the tools you mentioned, Coraline, are really, sound really cool. And I, I, I really, really hope I never have to use them. <laughs> but, um, but I, you know, I have experienced stuff like that a little bit. I've experienced harassment, but like early on, like pre World Wide Web days, like on inter on email lists and, sh and stuff like that. And you know, um, I, I would stress so hard about it. And I was, I was, I, it, was really, it was like crippling and it was just, it was minor in comparison to what you're talking about. And it was, I'm just, I just wasn't good at it. <laughs> I really wasn't good at not taking that stuff personally. And so, uh, those are little ways that I try to do that. Um, and if I, I guess if I feel like I need to pull back, I do pull back and I try to surround myself with people who I know are cool. And if I need to shut down and like throw my phone across the room, and, and turn my computer off and lock it down, shut it all down for a while. That's just what I'll do. Right on. So I know we usually we usually end on a on a slightly off off the topic note, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, we just kind of like to share things things you've been enjoying lately. Like, is there anything in particular that's like outside? It doesn't have to be tech related or job related or community related. Like, what's something that you've just been really into in the past few weeks? I use music to control my mood and I'm really lucky. Um, my girlfriend's from Sweden and she has a vastly different music library than I do. And she's is been it sharing. Sweet, is it Swedish black metal? No, <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, more shoegazer <laughs> stuff. Um, so she's introduced me to some bands that I really like a lot. Um, Blue Foundation is really amazing um, music. Um, Radio Department, um, Mojave 3. Um, Jenny Haval um, and Beach House are all like music that I absolutely adore now that I've just found within the last month or so. Um, awesome. And um, yeah, I, I, I'm very particular about music in that um, I'm very emotionally um, and psychologically affected by what I listen to. So um, I curate my music library pretty carefully and select my music during the day pretty carefully um, to make sure that I'm, you know, as, as positive as I can be and as um, 
feel just as warm as I can feel. Um, so, uh, yeah, I have to, I've heard a thing for that and, um, go music. Awesome. I can dig it. I listen to, which is, you know, I, I am pretty into music and, and other stuff, but what I often find that I do to calm my anxiety levels down is I listen to something that one has nothing to do with my career. Like I don't, I don't listen to any like tech podcasts or anything like that very intentionally. Um, well, you listen to this one because you're on it, right? Yeah, if I'm <laughs> on it because I like listening to my voice, that is soothing um, to me. Uh, that is uh, that's something that I will definitely do. But um, I, I, I listen to uh, some comedy podcasts and also like I listen to this guy who's kind of a pretty well known. Um, Sport, well, sports and entertainment writer called Tony Kornheiser, and he's now he used to be on the radio for many years, and now he's on. Uh, now he's uh, he just does a podcast, um, and he's just this older guy who's from Long Island but lives in DC now. And I don't know, he's just fun, and he's kind of a loudmouth uh, Jewish guy, but funny and actually a real sweet guy, but. I've been listening to him for like 15 years and I find it, I guess I find it calming in the same way that I find like, Oh, I'm going to watch like some, you know, certain comedies or certain, you know, TV shows or something. It's like, it just, it lets me escape from stuff and I don't have to worry about it. And it kind of distracts me and it's just nice. And a lot of times I listen to stuff like that because I can't, it, it, uh, other stuff just agitates me too much. So I, it, it's again, it's sort of that same being very conscious of what I'm sort of like, what environment I put myself in and what do I, what do I allow to sort of like be, you know, in my environment and the choices that I make of things that are soothing to me or not. Uh, those are the kinds of things. So yeah, I listen to the Tony Kornheiser podcast, which a lot of people probably will think like why are you doing this you you are very old and i would say kind of but uh that's that's what i do so uh, yeah a lot of a lot of podcasts uh because i find those more soothing where it's just people talking right and that that is a big thing for me and it's just it's not like i can't like the exact opposite of watching is watching like the show silicon valley for me i can't watch that show yeah no (laughs) That's so stressful. I understand that sentiment. <laughs> I, like, this, not watch that show? No. Can't do it. I can't do it. It's just I'm just like, oh god, I know exactly what's going to happen. This is going to be a shit show. <laughs> so yeah, I don't. It, I don't find it enjoyable. It's, there's nothing really wrong with it. It's just that it's. I can't. I can't. I don't enjoy it. It's not all. for you. Yeah. Right. So yeah. It's, it's cool, man. Do your thing. <laughs> so yeah, that's kind of where I'm at with that stuff. Uh, so yeah, you know. Cool. Uh, well, along the music and listening to things theme, uh, PJ, you mentioned this a couple weeks ago, but I've gotten into it lately as well. Uh, Spotify has been doing this Discover Weekly oh, yeah. playlist, and it's curated for you, I'm assuming, based on the playlist that you have and your history with Spotify. Um, and every once in a while, they're a little bit off, but I've been finding that it's fairly dead on with stuff that I really enjoy and really appreciate. Um, so that's been a fun, fun little surprise every Friday when, when I'm needing music to get me through the rest of the afternoon. Yeah. I've also noticed that they, they've actually started, there's a daily digest that they give you of 10 songs. I think it depends. I listen to Spotify a lot. Um, like a lot, a lot. It's kind of disgusting um so i think they finally decided to discover weekly just wasn't often enough so they decided to start something okay we curated a list of 10 which is a little bit rough i can't always get to it but um i've also specifically this is my, my decompress my enjoyment thing i'm now specifically going out to screw up the whole spotify discover weekly thing um by listening to things that don't fit in with what they think i because i realized that like three weeks in a row i'm like this is like the same like you're literally sending me songs i've been listening to for 20 years Oh. I, I know who Sunny Day Real Estate is. I know who Weezer is. I was there in the 90s. Ni- I remember the 90s. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's like, I, I know all these songs. So let's, let's go out, like, let's start listening to some of the, the less known stuff. Let's start listening to, you know, Sun Ra and like jazz greats of the 1950s and see how that's going to affect my Discover Weekly. Let's throw in, for no apparent reason, I'll listen to To Pimp a Butterfly by Kendrick Lamar again for three hours straight 
just to see what's going to happen to Discover Weekly. So maybe the next time, next podcast, I'll have an update on that. But uh, it's some myself, my son, and my daughter. We're all three doing it. We're listening to things we don't listen to, just nice. to find out what happens to Discover Weekly. I have to keep us posted for sure. Absolutely. I, you know, I'm, I'm disrupting Spotify. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, Ed Coraline, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. It's been thank you. A yeah, great really conversation. Fun. Yeah. It has been fantastic, and I can't wait to see everybody soon, and I'm sure we'll all run into each other somewhere along the way. But I hope for so. Now, for now, this has been Community Pulse. Uh, I am PJ uh, at Esplenic on Twitter. And I am Mary at Mary underscore Grace on Twitter. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.